Um, I'd like to now hand it over to Deborah Salon, who is coming to us from Arizona State University. Um, please go ahead and share your screen. Thanks so much. Um, here we go. Um, so I'm an associate professor here at the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at ASU. And together with um, colleagues at the University of Illinois at Chicago and, and folks here, we have been working on trying to understand um, behavioral changes in households between, you know, before the pandemic to during the pandemic and also how people expect um, any behavioral changes that they might have experienced during the pandemic to perhaps persist um, even after the pandemic is no longer a threat. So that's what I'll be talking about today. We were funded through a rapid grant um, through the CMMI program at NSF um, and a few other places as well <laughs> have helped support this work. So COVID-19 has required most of us to really make big changes to our daily lives. And our research is trying to understand both what those changes were, how large they were, and also, but perhaps more importantly, will some of these new behaviors really stick? So we conducted a national survey. Um, the survey we call the COVID Future Survey, and you can learn a lot more about our work um, at our website, www.covidfuture.org. Um, this is just to show you that I'm obviously not alone. I have a, um, working with a large research team. This doesn't even actually, we've added more, more team members recently. So this is not even fully representative of the group. It's a big, it's a big effort. Um, the survey we've collected, um, wave one of the, the full wave one of the survey, it's a multi-wave survey. The full wave one was nearly 10,000 respondents from across the US. Um, today, I'll be reporting results on a, a subset of those people, um, a bit over 7,000 of them. So the survey sections, we, we're transportation researchers, most of us, and so we were interested in how this pandemic has affected transportation-related um, behaviors. So actually, I was quite interested in the previous presentation, thinking about movement, you know. But anyhow, uh, our survey looks at uh, how people are accessing these different activities, employment, working and studying, shopping and dining, how they you know, conduct their transportation on, on, on a daily basis during the pandemic, pre-pandemic and expectations for the future. Um, the survey took between 15 and 30 minutes. Um, it was, wave one was implemented starting in April of 2020 and went through October. The data I'll be presenting today is really more from the July through October period. Um, that sample size was about 9,000. We've actually collected an additional around 1,000 since then. Wave two was implemented from November to April. About 3,000 people responded to that. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments on what we found in wave two today, but I don't have any formal findings on that. Wave three, we're going to be implementing in about a month, starting mid-September to mid-October. Um, and we're currently applying for funding to conduct two or three additional survey waves. We had originally imagined that one year would be enough time to, um, or maybe a year and a half would be enough time to really understand the, the effect you know, during the pandemic and post-pandemic, but obviously that has not unfortunately happened. And so to understand the more long-term impact on people's behavior, we really need to continue following folks into the future. Um, just to give you an idea of where our respondents came from, they're from all over the US, although there is an overrepresentation in Arizona, as you can see. Um, we do, you know, to account for regional differences and also differences between our sample and the US population as a whole, we do use a weighting scheme and these are the main variables we weight on plus um, region of the country. Um, more details about a lot of the results I'll be presenting in a minute are available in our recently published brief report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and I'll, um, I'll put a link to that. It's, it's open access, so I'll put a link in the chat after this presentation. So a couple of things. One, one of the big questions we had was really, you know, would you like to continue any of the things that you're doing now after COVID-19 is no longer a threat? And, and this, this is pie chart just showing how people answered that question. Um, and we were maybe not surprised, but, but interested to see that uh, uh, the vast majority said either yes or maybe. 
um, to this question. So there are definitely some things that people are experiencing during this crisis time that they find uh, that they like and that they might want to continue. And so here's just a chart showing what some of those things were. And the top thing is working for WFH means works from home, working from home at least some of the time. Um, but you can see some of the some of these other items are perhaps some of the things you've been enjoying during the pandemic, spending more time with family, taking more walks, spending less money, cooking a bit more, etc. Um, so just honing in on a couple of these main results. So working from home. Um, our data forecast, not only that we've seen a large increase in working from home, but they forecast a large um, continuation of, of increased work from home. Um, so you can see here the pre-COVID actual percentage was about 23% of people work from home at least a few times a month. So these aren't people that work from home every day, but regularly and somewhat frequently. So then, and that has gone up to over 40% in during in the during COVID period, and people expect to continue this. Now, this is a little misleading that there isn't that much of a drop here because these people are working from home mostly almost every day, whereas this percentage is more of an indication of like a couple times a week is more of what people are generally saying. But in any case, people are planning to continue this behavior. Um, this chart shows a little bit more detail on that, um, but I don't think I have time to go into it that much more. <laughs> um, looking at a second kind of related big behavior that we're very interested in is car commuting. So we see that our data forecast a related decrease in car commuting perhaps, which is, um, you know, if people are working from home at least a couple of days a week, you can imagine that this, this would happen, right? They're commuting a couple of days less. So that's what this is reflecting. We asked a lot of our questions and about what they expect in the future, and then we asked why. Um, and so this is an example of, of kind of the type of question we were asking, looking at, you know, if people said they anticipated to be traveling less by air after COVID-19 was no longer a threat, we said, well, why? And gave them a bunch of possible reasons that they could select from. And then we divided those reasons into things that were like new realizations, like I realized I could conduct my business meetings um, using video conferencing or pandemic related reasons, which were more like, oh, I, uh, I, I don't wanna fly because I'm worried about getting sick, right? So we think that these new realizations might be more long lasting than the pandemic related reasons for a lot of people. But in any case, what we can see here is that the blue, which is the new realization is the darker blue, the things that were sort of neutral is the, the medium blue, and then the light blue is the pandemic related reasons that we think might disappear if COVID-19 really does become not a threat. But in any case, we can see on the business side, there's a lot of people saying they're gonna be flying um, less, not so much on the personal flying side, but a little bit. And the last, um, well, maybe not the last, one of the last things I wanna talk about was uh, mentioning that one thing, you know, in the, on the earlier slide, I was saying, highlighting things that people said they wanted to keep from the pandemic um, time period. And one of the things was taking more walks. And that's reflected in um, another aspect of the survey where we asked people, you know, how often they wanted to do different, use different modes of transportation. And a lot of people said that they wanted to walk more. Um, and the next slide shows a little more detail on this. Um, and then I think this is really the last thing I was gonna talk about, which is dining and shopping. So we asked about um, how many times people dined in restaurants pre-COVID and how many times they expected to dine in restaurants you know, on a you know, weekly or monthly basis post-COVID. And you can see that these frequent diners, the people who said they dine in restaurants a few times a week or more are really um, expected to, to drop. And, and that's something that I think is um, likely of concern to the restaurant industry. Um, and so not only can you find more information about our survey and our publications at covidfuture.org, but there's also a link to our data, which is freely available for download. Right now, wave one is available. We'll be posting wave two in the coming um, weeks and wave three once we've collected it and cleaned it and weighted it. Um, so thanks so much. And let me know and look forward to the conversation later.
Oh, thank you so much, Deborah. And it's it's really interesting to hear that there's already like a little bit of a dialogue and an overlap between some of the work you're doing and, and from Jen Long, who you know went right before you did. So that's I mean that's the whole point of the Kick webinar, and we're so glad to see those connections happening in real time.